Good morning, everyone, or afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us for our webinar today, um, Engaging African Americans in Substance Use Disorder Treatment. Um, our speaker today is Mark Sanders. Um, your webinar hosts today are the Great Lakes ATTC, PTTC, and MHTTC. All three of these programs are funded by SAMHSA. Um, We are funded under these federal grants. Um, because we are funded by a federal agency, we need to let you know that um, at the point of this presentation, the opinions expressed here are the views of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the official position of SAMHSA. Our webinar format today will be um, recorded the webinar will be recorded and available for viewing along with the PowerPoint slides on our YouTube channel and our websites. Um, today's audio will be broadcast through your computer speaker, so please make sure that your speakers are turned up and on. There is no call-in number. We'll be using the chat box feature throughout the webinar. Um, you can add questions or comments, and we will have a Q&A session after the presentation, so feel free to um, enter any questions that you have. Our presenter today is Mark Sanders. Um, Mark is an international speaker, trainer, and consultant in the behavioral health field whose work has reached thousands throughout the United States, Europe, Canada, the Caribbean, and the British Isles. Mark has been a certified addictions counselor for 34 years. He has received numerous awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Illinois Addiction Counselor Certification Board and the Barbara Bacon Award for Outstanding Contributions to Social Work Pre Profession as a Loyola University of Chicago alumni. He is also the author of five books focused on behavioral health and the co-founder of the Serenity Academy of Chicago, the only recovery high school in Illinois. He has a 30-year career as a university educator having taught at the University of Chicago, Illinois State University, Illinois School of Professional Psychology, and Loyola University of Chicago School of Social Work. Mark has also created and serves as the curator for the online museum at African American Addictions, Treatment, and Recovery. We're excited to have you today, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark. Uh, thank you so very much. And it looks like I might have uh, just temporarily for a second uh, lost the slide, but I, I will begin, uh, and then uh, I should have it by then, hopefully. All right, so uh, about a year ago, can everyone, uh, can you hear me? Uh, about a year ago, uh, I was traveling in from Arizona to Chicago where I live, and I was sitting next to a man with six purple hearts. Those of you on the call are probably wondering, how do you get a purple heart? Uh, he was a World War II veteran. Uh, who got those Purple Hearts for a demonstration of bravery. In other words, for four hours, I'm sitting next to the bravest human being that I've ever met uh, in my life. He said, Mark, what do you do? I said, I'm a social worker. I talk to social workers and counselors and case managers, people who help others for a living. And this brave man told me to tell you, thank you for your service. I read a book called Good to Great, and the author says that you can tell what's most important to a society by its tallest buildings. He said that 100 years ago, the tallest buildings were Fortune 500 companies, or just recently in Fortune 100 companies, whereas 100 years ago, the tallest buildings were churches. And the author says that no society is great just because you have tall buildings and Fortune 500 companies and Fortune 100 companies. You're great when you have great social workers and counselors and case managers and people who help others for a living, so I salute those of you on this call for your greatness. Uh, 34 years in the field, people often ask me what keeps you going, and it's really the fact that people can and do recover. So I always like to begin these presentations with a recovery story, and this is the one that I choose today. Uh, I was doing counseling uh, six uh, teenage girls, and between these six teenage girls, they had six days of recovery. In other words, the only recovery they had was that day. And I heard in the residential facility where they were receiving services, there was a 19-year-old emerging adult, young adult woman, 
uh, who had uh, three years of recovery. So I selfishly thought what you would have thought. We need her in this group so her recovery can rub off on them. So I called her counselor and I asked can she be in the group. Her counselor said, no, she can't be in the group. She's doing fine all by herself. I called the second time, can she be in the group? No, she's doing fine all by herself. I called the third time and maybe there's something magical about three. Her therapist says, okay, she can be in the group. Turns out she wasn't doing fine. She came to the group and said, I was planning to relapse today. Our timing was impeccable. The second group she attended, she told me that she wanted to be a social worker to help girls. And I said, you can do it, you can do it. You can become a social worker, you can help girls. She came back the following week and said that when I said she could be a social worker, she cried all week. She said she had uh, four therapists in the past and told them all that she wanted to be a social worker, and no one said you can do it. And then I told her that there's only two things that qualifies a person to do the work that you do. You're either an expert, meaning you went to school to study it, or you are a witness, you've lived it. So here's her study story. She was living with her parents, and she witnessed the domestic violence her father towards her mother. And she and the mother were con convinced that one day the father would kill the mother, and so they fled to Chicago feeling safe, living with an uncle who abused her. She started using drugs to cope. After I said you can be a social worker, you can do it, she was in community college majoring in general studies, and she declared, I'm going to be a social worker. So she received an associate's degree in social work. And then she went to university and received a bachelor's degree in social work. In May of 2018, she asked me to meet her at the agency. She had a surprise for me. And she was wearing a sweatshirt from one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And she showed me a letter where they honored her with $50,000 in scholarship money. And I attended her graduation ceremony June 15th, 2019 where she received a master's degree in social work. It's been those kind of experiences that have kept me going all these years, and I imagine it's those types of experiences that have kept the rest of many of you on this line going as well. Welcome to the webinar. Would you join me in giving the ATTC uh, network, Great Lakes ATTC, a virtual round of applause for sponsoring this webinar today, and we shall begin. Our topic is Engaging African Americans in Substance Use Disorders treatment. And we will begin uh, with a discussion of reasons African Americans resist substance use disorders treatment. So the research says that nearly 45% of clients seeking recovery will miss their second outpatient session, and those numbers are even higher for African Americans. Research also suggests that African Americans seek addictions treatment voluntarily less frequently than the general population. And some of those reasons include historical uh, mistreatment or maltreatment leading to mistrust of institutions. The most famous of those experiences is the Tuskegee experiment. And I imagine that many of you have heard of the Tus Tuskegee experiment, where there were African Americans who uh, had syphilis. And they went to the clinic in Alabama, Tuskegee, uh, looking for medication for syphilis, the treatment of syphilis. And they were told that they were being given medication, but it really was a placebo. And what the researchers wanted to find out was um, how syphilis would spread if untreated. And so that was one of those first big experiments. Uh, another reason African Americans um, are resistant to substance use disorders treatment is high rates of mandated treatment. 10% um, of the clients we served were harmed in previous treatment. And the research also suggests that uh, even for first-time admissions, say for mental illness, African Americans are often given more chronic diagnosis or even more or less hopeful diagnosis uh, like antisocial personality disorder, uh, et cetera. Uh, not feeling welcome and discomfort with the counselor or the counselor's approach does not match problem-solving approaches within the client's culture. One mental health example uh, is a situation in which uh, there was a patient, African American male, who was diagnosed by the psychiatrist is having schizophrenia, alcoholism, et cetera. So the psychiatrist believed that the treatment should be uh, medication and uh, psychotherapy. And from the client's cultural perspective, he was uh, religious, his religious belief, his family's belief, was that he was really demon-possessed and that the treatment should be prayer and the laying of hands. You could see just through that one example 
how they were uh, how they were miles, literally miles uh, apart. And it looks like uh, I may have lost the audio there, so I will continue to talk during the presentation. Can everybody still follow along with me? Looks like it may have uh, came back. It's back. All right. All right. Um, so let me go back to that one slide. Okay. Not feeling welcome. The council. Okay. Substance use may uh, be viewed as a coping mechanism and solution to life challenges. I have started to believe uh, that at the core of addiction is a uh, trauma, and much has been written and, and 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 spoken about that. It took me a long time to reach that conclusion, and certainly African Americans have experienced their fair share of trauma. So when clients say that it, it's a coping mechanism, it helps me deal with my life problems, my challenges, etc. In 2020, I believe them. And then finally, historical knowledge of the consequences of talking and sharing your truth. Those of you on the call are aware that uh, counseling really is about, a great deal of counseling is about talking. And uh, I'm suggesting in this seminar that historically African Americans have paid a price, uh, some, often a big price, for sharing their truth, for talking. So we have here a slide with Dr. Martin Luther King, who was outspoken against racism in America in the 60s. The end result of that is that he was investigated by the, uh, by the Internal Revenue Service, wiretapped by the uh, FBI, and of course he was assassinated. Malcolm X was also outspoken. The price he paid was that he was shadowed by the CIA, he was wiretapped by the FBI, and assassinated. And Angela Davis, the great, the great famous, well-known Black Panther, for speaking, she was labeled as un-American, a communist, and fired for speaking her truth. And then there's W.E.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to ever graduate from Harvard University. Uh, for speaking, he was labeled as communist, un-American, and he was exiled to Africa. And then we have Paul Robeson, the great orator, the great athlete, the great singer. He was labeled as communist for speaking and ex exiled to Russia. And then there's Jack Johnson, the first African-American heavyweight boxer in U.S. history. As we speak, I actually live in a building where Jack Johnson lived when he was indicted for white slavery. You should know that the year that he uh, won the heavyweight boxing championship, riots broke out in 19 cities in the, in, the, in the United States. And the way that law worked was that Jack Johnson was very outspoken. He married a woman who was white, and he drove her outside of Illinois lines and they had a rule on the books called white slavery that said that no white woman would, um, um, under her own volition, um, voluntarily go across state lines in the car with a black male. And so because he was indicted for that, he was told that the one way uh, you won't go to prison is if uh, you were actually to throw a fight. Now, some of you might have seen the movie uh, based upon his life called The Great White Hope. Uh, Billy Holiday, there's a book that I encourage everyone to read. It's called Chasing the Screen, and it tells the story of the American war on drugs in the 1930s. Uh, we had a war on drugs in the 1930s because of prohibition. Every time we outlaw a job, a, a drug, uh, gangs uh, often get involved. And so back in the 1930s, there was a war on drugs with Italian gangsters like Al Capone, Irish gangsters like Bugs Moran, Mexicans, Mexicans along the southern border, uh, which at one time many of those states were called Mexico, uh, the Chinese in San Francisco, and one African-American woman, Billie Holiday, after she sang a strong song called Strange Fruit. I imagine that some of you on this call have heard the song Strange Fruit. For the rest, I, I say that there's, there's a video on YouTube, and uh, it's, she tells the story of living or uh, visiting the southern states uh, and seeing African-American men hanging from trees. And Billy Holiday said, that's strange fruit. And the director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which later became known as the FBI, told Billy Holiday that you need to stop singing that song because if you continue to sing that song, you'll incite a riot. We heard that you use heroin. And if you keep singing that song, we will deny you the right to sing based upon your use of heroin. And Billie Holiday said, I will continue to sing this song. They silenced me when I was 10 years old, and they will never silence me again. Here's what she meant. 
when she was born, her mother was raising her as a single parent. Her father left. And her mother struggled to make ends meet. So in order to make ends meet, she was raised in a brothel. Yes, uh, Billie Holiday was raised in a brothel, a house of uh, prostitution. And when she was 10 years old, there was a raid at the brothel. And the police took her mother to jail. And when her mother returned to the brothel, there was a grown man having sex with 10-year-old Billie Holiday. He was prominent, so they let him go. And they put her in solitary confinement for a year. The United Nations says that everything over two weeks is considered torture. So she was traumatized for being traumatized. She came out and started drinking alcohol at age 11, started using heroin at age 14. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics continued to fi follow her for singing that song. And she died in a, in a, in a detoxification facility trying to withdraw from heroin of cirrhosis of the liver caused by her drinking. Continuing to sing that song, she paid a heavy price. And then there's Muhammad Ali, stripped of his title for speaking out against the Vietnam War and refusing to be drafted in the Vietnam War. Then, of course, as we get closer to modern times, there's Ice-T, the rapper from California, I think South Central L.A., who made a song called Cop Killers. And because he made that song, speaking out against uh, police uh, mistreatment of African Americans in California, Ice-T was investigated by the FBI. And I tell people that he was silenced uh, because he was given a job as a TV police officer in a, sit in, a, in a program that's called Law and Order, which, by the way, he has very few speaking lines in Law and Order. And then there are the rappers Chuck D and Flavor Flav, the Hall of Fame rappers from Public Enemy. And if you listen to Chuck D's ly lyrics, he uh, speaks as a revolutionary about racism, exploitation, etc. But to kind of balance out his power, there's Flavor Flav, who like, uh, speaks in like clown-like language to balance out the revolutionary uh, message of Chuck D. We have Ludacris and Nas, current rappers who lost their endorsements for speaking out. And of course, uh, uh, former President Barack Obama was labeled as un-American, not one of us, a communist, and gun sales increased. And then there's the mother of Tupac Shakur, a member of the Black Panther Party, who was indicted for a murder she didn't com com uh, commit after sharing her truths. So in summary, as an African-American, history says if you speak your truth, you can get assassinated, exiled, fired, labeled communist, or un-American. So with that as a backdrop, we want to spend a little time talking about strategies for engaging African-American clients in substance use disorders treatment within the first 10 minutes of contact, because what's really, really clear is that clients make decisions really quickly about whether or not they want to come back. And so our first suggestion is that we create a welcoming environment. And I'm also suggesting that voice tone matters. There's a book that's called Blink. And it tells the story of how effective we are at, re at reading each other's minds. Uh, where we struggle most is if there are racial differences between two people. And they tell the story uh, about doctors who never get sued versus doctors who get sued two or more times. People don't like to sue doctors they like. And they found that there's primarily two differences between doctors who never get sued versus doctors who get sued two or more times. Doctors who never get sued on average speak to their patients 18 minutes per visit, and doctors who get sued two or more times speak to their patients on average 15 minutes per visit. The question is, what can happen in a three-minute window that can insulate a doctor from ever getting sued by their patient? The answer is, in those three minutes, you can take the time to find out who the patient is, what they do for a living, and if they have any questions. Second finding, the warmer the tone of voice of the doctor, the less likely they are to be sued by their patients. And so they did a study in which they took average everyday people out the streets and asked them, uh, to listen to uh, doctors inter inter interacting with their patients on the screen for 30 seconds. No words, just tone of voice. And what they found 
is that the warmer the tone of voice, the less likely doctors are to be sued by their patients. So what happens when African Americans call agency seeking services? Um, I believe that the voice tone really doesn't matter who answers the phone because that tone of voice uh, can send signals whether you are welcome or not even before you show up for your first session. The second point we have here uh, is uh, something that we can learn from doctor's offices that we want to uh, increase uh, attendance at first session um, sessions by 30%. And that's simply making a call the day before to remind the client, to remind the patient of their patient. Greeting matters. You know, I imagine that some of you have worked with receptionists that had really bad attitudes. And I would suggest that there are several reasons for that. One, they often are the lowest, lowest paid individuals at the organization. And number two, they have the largest case load at every agency. In other words, if there are 20 counselors working at your agency and uh, each one has a case load of uh, 20, uh, there is the, for the receptionist has a case load of 400 patients. And so they are vulnerable to a unique part of burnout that is called depersonalization. For African Americans seeking recovery that often have experiences of being ostracized and not welcome, uh, a, a lukewarm greeting from a receptionist can, go, can send the signal that you are not welcome here. Dr. King Minkoff believed from Harvard University, Ken Minkoff, that the receptionist greeting is so important that he traveled the country uh, teaching receptionists how to create a welcoming environment for clients seeking services. I also encourage all of you on this line to, uh, to, to, to uh, examine, walk around your agency. In fact, you might do that now on this call if you're on a cell, and look at the pictures on the wall. And one question to ask yourself is what do the pictures on the wall say about who's welcome and who's not? Years ago, um, I was working at an agency and we received a phone call from a man named Marv Dyson, CEO of WGCI radio station, 107.5 FM. At that time, the number one African-American radio station in the country. And they needed an agency to provide services for their radio personalities. And so I was excited, thinking I'm going to be a, a, a counselor for these famous d d DJs on the radio. So Mark Dyson said before he hired our agency to provide the services, he wanted a tour. And so he showed up and looked at the pictures on our wall. Every agency has pictures on the wall. I call it our wall of fame. These were people on the wall, pictures, that were significant to the agency. And Marv Dyson got out the elevator, looked at the pictures on our wall. Then he looked at me and he said, no pictures of African Americans on the wall, no pictures of women on the wall, no contract. And he left immediately. And that was 30 years ago. And since then, I've asked myself the question, when clients come in seeking services and they look at our walls, do they see images of themselves on our walls? And that's significant because that can send the signal as well, who's welcome and who's not welcome. An inviting waiting room helps. I'm a Ryan White evaluator. and You might remember Ryan White as a young boy who was HIV positive in the government puts lots of money in his name for HIV services. And one of the things I do is I meet with clients who've been diagnosed with HIV and ask them questions like, what do you like most about the program? Everything, what do you like least? The waiting room. I say, why, go in there. At every HIV wait, uh, program I've ever visited, the waiting room is exactly the same. All you see on the walls are posters of herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. They say, can't they put a fake Norman Rockwell on the wall or a plastic bonsai plant in the room? At one program, they said, open the closet door. And I opened the closet door, and condoms were raining down from the sky. They said, we feel disease just sitting in the waiting room. With that as a backdrop, I just wrote a, a blog post, a short article for the ATTC network about a program on the west side of Chicago called Above and Beyond. And what I wrote about is how well they engage African Americans and addictions treatment, just through, uh, beginning with the decor. Just the waiting room alone sends the signal that you are very important and we care about you and we think that you deserve to enter an environment that is really beautiful to look at. I've included some of the pictures. Also, incidentally, that program above and beyond, 
their receptionist is a master's level psychologist with strong engagement skills. They told me they believe that who clients have contact with when they first uh, talk, call someone on the phone or when they first walk in, uh, it really does matter because so many African Americans, especially in urban communities, sometimes the first person who greets them is armed security. So they want to make sure on the front end that the first person that they meet has clinical background and engagement skills. How about the magazines in the waiting room? One agency called me and said they wanted me to help them engage their clients in treatment more effectively. That 80% of their clients were missing their second outpatient setting, session. The national average is between 45 to 50%. So I said, well, you know, I'd like to sit in the waiting room for a couple days because I wanted to view the agency from the perspective of new clients coming in. So I sat in the waiting room, I was bored, and so I started thumbing through the magazines. There was Oprah Magazine, Good Housekeeping Magazine, Martha Stewart Magazine. They work with Latino and African American gang members. My first question was, who was the magazines for? And then there's the length of the wait. You know, for many people of color, including African Americans, uh, being kept waiting in the waiting room for long periods of time may also send the signal that you're not important, you're not valued here. So a short wait helps. And of course, when they first meet their counselor, positive and sincere service energy is also of the utmost importance. What African Americans seeking recovery need from helpers? Helpers who are able to discuss intersectionality and microaggressions. This can be particularly helpful in cross-cultural counseling relationships with African Americans. Intersectionality includes the ways in which the life of the counselor and the what life of the client are similar and yet different. I must confess, when I was in graduate school over three decades ago, I was taught to be a clinical coward uh, as it pertains to um, having sensitive and open discussions about cultural differences, about racial differences. I was taught in my field placement that if clients had difficulty working with me or trusting me because uh, of our differences, i.e. I being African American male, they being uh, like a different culture group, that they wouldn't come out and tell me directly. They would um, give hints and that my job as a clinician was to listen with a third ear. So, for example, if clients were struggling connecting with me because of our differences, they might come into my office and make statements like, it sure is dark outside today. Uh, my company had an audit, and we're happy to report that we're in the black. Uh, I can't wait for next Friday because we're going to a black tie affair. Oh, after Thanksgiving is Black Friday. That was my hint, according to my field instructor, that the client had some discomfort with me because of our cultural differences. So I was taught to ask. So what's it like for you to work with me, a counselor who's black? But what I now realize is that the problem with that is that I was putting all the pressure on the client to be the first one to talk about our differences. So the way intersectionality works is that you, the counselor, the case manager, you think about the ways in which your life is similar and different and that you are the one to put this on the, com on, on the table first to uh, help assure that these differences may not impact your ability to connect clinically. So for instance, there's a white male colleague of mine uh, from a small town, I mean really, really small town, who works in Chicago with African American youth. And he often begins sessions by saying, I imagine you're wondering how I, as a middle-aged white male who grew up on a farm, could understand your challenges growing up on the south side of the city of Chicago. And you're right, I don't know your, your challenges perfectly, but I think I'm going to learn a lot from you about those challenges. I'm going to pay attention to your facial expressions and body language as we talk to see how you're receiving my words, and I'll check in periodically with you to make sure that I understand what you're sharing with me because I ultimately want to make sure that we really connect. And not too long ago, I had a session with an African-American male, and I told him, uh, he was a gay African-American male, that... Um, that I understand a lot of what he's describing around his um, being discriminated against in the workplace and passed over for promotions. And I told him that the experience that he was having, uh, feeling uncomfortable sharing his partner, uh, bringing his partner to work or to family affairs, that I've never had those experiences. And so that we've had similar experiences and yet some different experiences. And through our time together, I expect a lot to learn a lot about his experiences. And I, too, will pay attention to his facial expression and body language 
uh, to see how he's receiving my words and understand what he's sharing uh, with me. And of course, microaggressions are intentional and unintentional slights. And let me suggest insult, uh, that even if uh, these insults, microaggressions are unintentional, they can still have, uh, be harmful and create walls instead of bridges in the clinical relationship. So the types of microaggressions experienced by African Americans, assumption of intellectual inferiority, assumption of second class citizenship, assumption of a lack of patriotism, assumption of violent tendencies. I read a report that said that African Americans are actually the least likely to own guns, something like less than 30%. Assumption of criminality. You know, I've been followed around malls since I was 13 years old, so I have what's called follow me radar. And I can tell who's following me when I go to a mall. No uniform is needed. I can feel who's following me. You get kind of used to it. And um, I shop quicker than most people because it's so uncomfortable being followed around malls. So a number of years ago, my wife and I took a trip, a journey to uh, Hawaii, Honolulu. And next to the Mall of America in Minnesota and Whitfield Mall in Schaumburg, Illinois, the largest mall connected to the United States at that time was a mall in Honolulu, Hawaii. So we're walking towards this mall. And I said to my wife, look at the size of this mall. People are going to follow me all over the mall. And we were there for nine hours and nobody followed me. It felt so weird not to be followed after all of these years of being followed that I almost thought about stealing something. Just kidding. Assumption of inferiority, an assumption of homogeneity of experiences, beliefs, and interpretations. So at seminars, I often ask audiences, what percentage of African Americans live in poverty? And the most common number that I get is 75% of African Americans live in poverty. And then I ask the audience, where did you get those numbers? Most common answer is the 10 p.m. news. And there's a book by Eugene Robinson that says that there are actually five uh, African American communities. He mentions a, a group that's called the culturally elite, the culturally elite, the powerful. And that includes people like Barack Obama and Oprah Winfrey. She's so powerful that she only needs, goes by one name, Oprah. Michael Jordan, who goes by one name, Michael. And then, uh, or Jordan. And then there's the African-American billionaire who did the commencement address at uh, Morehouse College and spontaneously um, paid the student loan debt of every senior graduating that day. A second group of African Americans uh, is what uh, Eugene Robinson called the middle class. Actually, the largest group of African Americans fall into the middle class. He mentioned a bi biracial group, including individuals like Barack Obama and Halle Berry and CNN host Don Lemon. By the way, Don Lemon being a, C uh, a CNN host, have you noticed that in national news that African Americans who are TV hosts are tend, tend to be lighter in average. They've done studies on that. And also, there are studies that indicate that African Americans who are lighter in skin make more money on average than those who are darker in skin. Let me suggest to you that a, a clinical issue when working with African Americans might be issues connected to uh, skin color. Another group he talked about are the emergent. These are immigrants from the Caribbean islands in Africa who come to America and who do quite well. One study indicated that uh, individuals migrating to America from Trinidad often are in the 95 percentile of earners in this country. Uh, Eugene Robinson also talked about a group called the abandoned, uh, the multi-generational poor that constitutes 25 percent of the black population in America. I've added a couple groups, rich rappers, hip hoppers like Snoop Dogg, who may not dress appropriately for an Oprah party, but they in themselves are a cultural group that are very influential. And then there are African Americans who, uh, who've never lived in a big city, lived in small towns, who may have cultural differences than African Americans in big cities. And how about those who have only primarily lived in suburban communities, who've never had an urban experience? As I think about these differences, I'm reminded of a book called The Sunflower, an amazing book. 
And it tells the story of a Nazi during World War II that was hospitalized in Poland, and he was dying. And he had but one living request before he died. He wanted to apologize uh, to a Jewish person uh, for something that he did that he said was horrible uh, before he died. So they went all over the hospital listen, looking for a Jewish person for him to apologize to. And a Jewish man walked in his room. And he says, I want to apologize to you because I did something really horrible. Me and a few other Nazis, he said, uh, we burned up a house that had about 40 Jews in it. And a Jewish patient got up and ran out of the room. So that was the first half of the book. The second half of the book was about um, clergy of all denominations, including Desmond Tutu, weighing in on whether or not the Jewish patient should have accepted the apology. And to me, the best response came from a rabbi who said, that's how events like the Holocaust happen, is people sometimes will take you as one homogenous group and treat everybody exactly the same. As a matter of fact, uh, those of you in this call, most of you are aware of the Central Park Five where those young men were guilty, but it was like any black will do. And so I bring up this, uh, the issue of uh, uh, making sure that we see the diversity within African American communities because everybody's a unique individual and that should be reflected in uh, how we treat them, uh, and including uh, the treatment plan itself. Um, examples of microaggressions that can occur in clinical relations include uh, statements made by therapists like, I know you'll be late for the next session. Uh, do you play basketball? The assumption that all African American men play basketball. Do uh, you speak good English? The assumption being that I don't expect you to speak good English. Uh, we're having fried chicken for lunch next week at, at the agency. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it, right? So, you know, wh again, you know, Freud said that only 7% of what we communicate are uh, the words that we could come out of our mouth. We should really pay attention to how our words are impacting people. And if we see client discomfort with something that we said, sometimes all we have to do simply is just, uh, just make the statement. You look very uncomfortable when I make that statement. We give the client the opportunity to elaborate, we apologize, and just suggest to them that we're going to continue to pay attention to how they're receiving our words. And sincere apologies can go a long way. When African Americans uh, need from helpers continued, helpers to understand his or her own diverse identities, examine their own isms, their racism, their homophobia, their ageism, etc., and strive to practice cultural humility. You know, cultural humility is different than uh, cultural competence. Cultural competence makes an assumption. And the assumption is that once you learn a certain amount of information about a cultural group, then you can get your certificate of completion. You are culturally competent. Uh, there are many practitioners who are starting to believe that total cultural competence is impossible. In other words, you can read 300 books on Chinese culture, and there will still be some things about cu Chinese culture that you simply wouldn't understand. Cultural humility uh, says that um, I am humble enough uh, to admit that I don't know everything there is to know about your culture, but I remain teachable and open to learn more. If I'm honest, I don't know everything about my own culture. I'm still, still starting to learn more as we speak. In fact, I learned five years ago that the first prominent recovering alcoholic in America was Frederick Douglass. And he, uh, his famous quote is, we can't stagger to freedom that he was traumatized during slavery and started drinking in freedom, and he believed that alcohol was a way to control the slaves. He said, so they would whip us, beat us, Monday through Friday, and give us alcohol on Saturday, and alcohol was, was our medicine. And once we tasted the alcohol, the belief was that we would never want to escape. Who would want to leave, leave their medicine? And so he gave up alcohol, started what was called the Black Temperance Movement, as a way of helping Africans who were enslaved and, and now free deal with the tendency to drink to deal with the trauma. Um, helpers that focus on strengths. So much of counseling focuses on our deficits. Even in intake, we ask questions like, um, what's your income? For those of you who work in publicly funded programs, you know that many of your clients may not have much income. Uh, what type of work did you do? Go to a party and ask a man who he is, he'll tell you what he does. 
for some people hearing that question can make them uncomfortable. Do you have custody of all of your kids? You know, one of the things that came out of the war on drugs is that there were a lot of women of color, Latino, African American women, who had their babies taken away based upon the stigma of addiction in communities of color, not based on research at all. So I found that asking a series of strength-based questions during the intake engagement phase can go a long way towards engaging African American clients in substance use disorders treatment. Questions like, what do you do well? You know, how many of you on this call believe it takes a special skill to support a drug habit without a job? It really does take special skills. How have you been able to endure so much? That's, that question right there is a trauma-related question. You know, African Americans have been through lynchings and slavery and, and Jim Crow laws, great deal of trauma, historical trauma. When I think of that question, how have you been able to endure so much, I think about my grandmother. My father died smoking crack cocaine May 29, 1986. And my grandfather, my father's father, died of a heart attack. We think he died of a, a broken heart a few months after my father, his son, died. My grandmother responded to the loss, to the death of her husband and only child by having a stroke. There's some people who love so strong that when people that they love die or get sick, they experience it in their body. My grandmother never walked again. For 10 years, she was bedridden. A decade after my father died, my grandmother died, and the plan was for me and my brothers and sisters to plan her funeral. How are we going to do that? Because when she was alive, she did all the planning. My brother wandered through the house and found her Bible and said, turn to the 23rd Psalm and you'll know exactly what to do. The 23rd Psalm was the part of the Bible that my grandmother recited when she felt stressed. We turned to the 23rd Psalm, and a bunch of papers fell on the floor. And these papers were difficult to read. We think they were difficult to read because my grandmother wrote those, those, those little notes on the small pieces of paper upside down in the bed laying on her back. One note said, at my funeral, I want to wear my hair the way I wore it in the 1940s. We did the best we could. Another note said, at my funeral, I want Sister Sarah to sing the song Amazing Grace. That song has never been sang better. One note said, I want Reverend Emmett to preach my eulogy. I want Deacon Jones to say a few words at my funeral. My grandmother wrote, I know he's shy, ask him anyway. And the deacon spoke. He did a good job. And one note said, I want all five of my grandkids to speak at my funeral. We all spoke. So following the funeral was the burial, and I'm in a limousine, and it hit me. That even though my grandmother looked so frail and helpless the last de decade of her life, she was powerful beyond measure. She was so powerful that she was able to plan her own funeral. I've never looked at people the same since. Gerda said nobody rides to low expectations. She said, see a person for who they are, they become worse. But see them for who they could be, they become who they should be. How have you been able to endure so much? What do you like to do in your leisure time? I asked that question to an African-American male who was 70 years old, mandated. Have you ever worked with a 70-year-old court-mandated man? He used heroin for 50 years. He said, I've forgotten more than you'll ever know about drugs. So answer the question, what do you like to do in your leisure time? He said, I don't talk about it much. All right, I'll tell you. He asked me if I ever heard of Miles Davis, the famous jazz, um, 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 jazz musician. I said, sure. He said, I play the guitar in my leisure times, and I also play the drums in my leisure time. When Miles Davis would come to town, I would be his local drummer. Would you like to see an album cover while I was listed as Miles Davis's drummer? I said, sure. He said, I'll bring it next week. So all the initial resistance was gone, and we were guaranteed at least two sessions. What's the best thing you ever made happen? Is an assumption that even though you were struggling with active addiction, there were some things that you may have accomplished before your addiction. What are the best three moments you can recall in your life? That question also makes an assumption that you had a life before substance use disorders. What have you learned from what you've gone through? That strength-based question suggests that whatever you've gone through can be a learning experience, and therefore it wasn't for naught. 
Helpers that establish an egalitarian relationship, and what I mean by that is a relationship of equals. I think Maya Angelou told Oprah Winfrey that only equals can engage, only equals can be friends, primarily equals connect. And one way helpers can establish an egalitarian relationship with African Americans seeking recovery is to make sure the client has a voice in the treatment plan. You know, one good question to ask clients seeking treatment is what are your goals in recovery? A willingness to have a sensitive discussion of race and other differences. So I was teaching in a school of psychology, and my students were like working with a diverse clientele, and they were working with African-American clients, and they felt some racial tension. And they said, Mark, we would like to talk about our differences, but we are afraid if we talk openly about our differences with African-American clients that that will incite a riot. And I told my students that I've actually studied riots, and what I've learned is that riots do not occur because people talk about race and other differences. Riots occur when people stop talking. You know, I've read scholars talk about this, but my first reference point is a singing group from Watts in California called The Whispers. And in 1967, in Watts, California, they had race riots, just as they had race riots in Detroit, Michigan in 1967, race riots in Chicago, Illinois in 1968. And the whispers were like young, young fellows at the time of that riot in 67 and Watts. And in response to that riot, they made a song called I've Got to Do Wrong. And here are the lyrics. Nobody saw me walking, and nobody heard me talking. I was walking and I was talking, but nobody saw me walking, and nobody heard me talking. Seems like I've got to do wrong, I've got to do wrong, I've got to do wrong before they notice me. That actually riots are, is really the language of the voiceless, the ignored in our society. And when people are able to talk about their pain, it has a way of lessening the pain. Transparency and authenticity helps. Then, of course, an opening, an openness to multiple pathways of recovery. At this point, I want to pause for a moment to find out if anybody on the call has any questions for me before our... Uh, before our big finish towards the uh, end. Anybody have any, uh, call, any, any questions? Sometimes people are a little nervous to ask the first question. Let's hear, let's hear from the second person. Who has a question? Okay, so Anna, are these questions? Oh yeah, so someone wanted to know the quote. The quote is, see a person for who they are, they only become worse. But see them for who they could be, they become who they should be. Uh, let me just share with you the backdrop of that first story I share with you about the young woman uh, who told me she wanted to be a social worker. So following her graduation, they had a party and I attended a little party following the graduation at the university where she got her master's degree in social work. She said, Mark, how did you know? How did you know I could be a social worker? You spoke so, 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 so positive, so sure. How did you know? And I'll share with you the answer. You know, research by John Breer says that counselors, case managers, therapists, you, me, those of us on this call, that we experience more trauma in childhood than any other profession. But your brilliance is that you've taken what you've experienced in this lifetime and you have turned it into uh, empathy, compassion, and patience, uh, empathy and compassion, and you use it to help others. So as many of us are trauma survivors, um, I always try to keep up my mind what I have endured in this lifetime. Think about what you have endured in this lifetime. Your apprenticeship that got you to become an addictions professional. And what I say to myself, if I've endured all that and survived, of course she can get an MSW. Of course she can go back to school. Of course he will one day not be homeless. And I'm able to com communicate that conviction back to the client. What is your theoretical orientation? Ah, what a question. So for years I've taught evidence-based practices, right? 
I'm actually a fan of, uh, in, in, of integrating uh, cultural competence within evidence-based practices. And so uh, think about uh, how few, if any, evidence-based practices have actually been intentional about incorporating uh, cultural competence within the model. So that's something that I'm real clear about. I'm also a believer in like listening to what, um, so, uh, so I'm influenced by client-centered therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, et cetera, but I love to read the books of, of theoreticians when they turn 80 or 90 years old because what I start to learn is they start to see all of this uh, as dramatically different than when they wrote their theories when they were in their 40s and their 30s. One of my favorites, Irvin Yalom the father of group psychotherapy. And Irvin Yalom said, if I did therapy at my best, if I did therapy at my best, every session would be a new therapy. I'm a fan of that. Because you can marry one theoretical approach that may not work for every client. Or you may mar marry one theoretical approach that works for clients this week, but what's going on with that same client next week, it doesn't work. So what if we were so studious that we have 15 or different 20 models of working with clients? We could provide for the client what they needed that day. Let's see here. Uh, I saw another question. Okay. What do you say to someone that you shouldn't wear clothing from another culture that is, that is um, an appropriation uh, when you just love their clothes and styles but are not from their culture. You know, there's a lot of people. One of the things that I'm not a fan of all are these various athletic teams that use, like, sacred Native American images as mascots. And uh, when people tell me uh, that something is a, is a violation, a, a microaggression, I tend to believe them, and I tend to honor uh, their requests. Can you advise a way to engage a young client who is quiet and makes limited eye contact with a trauma history? Okay, okay, I can't see all the questions, but I tell you that uh, one of my greatest weaknesses as, as a therapist are, is with, when I work with clients or challenges who speak with me in one-word paragraphs. And sometimes I work with African-American males who are like adolescents or emerging adults, and I represent for some of these men the father who left them, or the uncle who never returns their calls. So some of them will speak to me in one-word paragraphs. So um, I have found, ultimately, to alter counseling methods, simply asking him what would be the best way for us to communicate. Sometimes with the younger fellows, we play board games. Sometimes I leave my desk, we shoot hoops. Art is a way of making that engagement. I tend to let the client lead um, how we work together under those circumstances. Uh, and then limited contact, you know, it's the small things that count. Because most of my clients are trauma survivors, I tend to sit on a 45-degree angle. So they are in 100% control when they look up and when they decide not to hold eye contact with me. What I have found is that when our eye contact increases slightly, then, we're in, then our rapport is increasing. And then I have found that if you as a counselor are blessed with a sense of humor, clients will hold more eye contact with you. Uh, etc. So the name of the Whisper song is I've Got to Do Wrong. Nobody saw me walking and nobody heard me talking. Think about it. Right now, rural America is in pain, and the cameras are not showing their pain, and so we're starting to see a lot of, a lot of rioting coming out of small-town America as we speak. You know, I learned my greatest lesson because we were talking about microaggressions earlier. I'm winding down on what it really takes to connect with another human being. I learned this lesson about uh, when I was, it connected to me being a senior in high school. And I learned the lesson a decade ago. I know I wasn't a senior in high school 10 years ago. It's been a long time since I walked across the high school stage. And when I was a uh, senior in high school, I played, I ran a sport called cross country. For those of you on the call, that sport involved running three mile races in the woods in November in Chicago with shorts on. It was cold, strange sport. I had a, Cub a teammate, teammate who was Cuban, and my Cuban teammate was the best runner on the team. And he invited me to live with he and his family my senior year in high school so he and I could run, uh, get up every morning and run five miles. Sound like fun? 
I agreed to do this for two reasons. One, his mother physically resembles my grandmother, and my grandmother is my heart. Number two, my, my friend's mother, my Cuban friend's mother, she can really cook like my grandmother. I said, okay, I'll stay. Now, his mother didn't speak a word of English, and every night she would cook these elaborate Cuban meals. And without saying a word to me, she would always sit directly across from me and watch me eat breakfast. And while I ate the breakfast, she, she would sit elbows on the table watching me eat, I knew, and with a smile. I knew what the smile meant. I expect you to eat every drop of the food on the plate. I would eat the food, go to bed, wake up in the morning, where she up to me in the kitchen and, with a warm breakfast, and she'd smile as I eat it. And that was my interaction with my friend's mother my senior year in high school. And he and I have been in contact with each other for for 40 years. And he has said to me for four decades, my mother asked more about you than any of my other friends. And she's always on my mind as well. Every Mother's Day, my first stop is her house where I bring her the largest bouquet of flowers. About a decade ago, my friend's brother, who was 35 years old, had a brain tumor. And before I could visit the hospital, the brother died. And five days later, they had the funeral. And I brought my wife to the funeral chapel for support. When I walked in the chapel, the mother was sitting in the front row uh, crying. She said in Spanish, he's family sitting in the front row. And I understand the word family in Spanish and sitting in the front row. That night I was driving, I was so angry with myself because I never learned to speak Spanish. And all I was thinking was that I learned to speak Spanish. I could have shared with the mother how I felt about the fact that she had just lost her son, that I somehow could have helped her with her grief. The next day was the burial, and the mother was standing next to me crying. And a voice came into my head, and the voice said, say something to her. Just say something. So I reached over and gave her a hug and whispered in her ear the first words I'd ever said to her in my life. I said to her, I love you. And she said to me, I love you too. And that was the first time we'd ever spoken. So I'm driving home feeling a little better. My wife says to me, now you and your friend's mother have a very peculiar way of communicating with each other. But what you have is the purest form of communication. What you have is a heart-to-heart -heart connection. I thought about it. I have all these books. The purpose of every book I ever read was to put something in a client's head so I can reach their head. But where we really connect with people is in the heart. The one thing that I know that is stronger than biases, assumptions, and stereotypes is a loving, caring heart. There's no defense against that. What I'd like to share with you is that I am the curator of the Online Museum of African American Addictions Treatment and Recovery. And the link to the museum is on this last slide. And if you visit the museum, in fact, I invite you to and hope that you will, you'll find counseling articles, how to work with African Americans in counseling, educational v DVDs, lots of books, music, podcasts, etc., all geared towards us helping uh, in clin our clinical work with African Americans with substance use disorders. So what I want to say to you, um, at the end of the day, it won't be um, how much we work every day, but it ultimately will be how much we've loved and how much we've helped others. And I hope that um, this webinar um, uh, has been helpful, and I'm going to uh, turn this over to Ann, and uh, she will say a few words. Thank you so very much for listening to me. Thank you, Mark. That was an incredible webinar. Um, I just want to let everybody know that we will be sending out um, a follow-up email with a quick survey that you could fill out, and then any of the other um, links or um, information that we shared during the webinar um, just for your reference. Um, again, I want to thank you all for your time, and especially thank you, Mark, um, for an absolutely incredible webinar. Thank you.